those foreheads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for days like today. It's days to be washed over by the truth, by the word of truth, to be set free by it. Thank you for this church, for those faithful to it, those who give in a variety of ways, whether financially or with their talent, with their time. We're so grateful for these moments that you've ordained from eternity past, especially for us. We pray for those in the congregation that can't be here this morning due to illness or distraction or otherwise, that you heal them and you bring them back to the fold. We pray also for those that are still lost in this world, Father, without hope that they be humbled, repent, and receive saving faith. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross 2,000 years ago to make moments like this a reality. We do just ask for your blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. All right, part 143, the book of Hebrews. I hope, I hope I don't have to keep saying this, but uh, I hope you read this week's blog. Um, the Spirit had me write about what we could rightly describe as an essential attribute of great leadership. There's a difference between good leaders and great leaders. Good leaders usually have one of those. Remember, you ever go to like a Red Sox game and they got those big fingers, right? That's what a good leader has. It's just like a big pointing finger. You know, go do this, go do that. And if you ever have any questions, just look at me because I'm awesome, right? That's an adequate leader, right? They get the job done, but that's not a great leader. That's not an inspiring leader leader. Um, so he had me write about an essential attribute of a great leader. Not just, there's not just one, but this one is the one he wanted you all to think about. Namely, empathy. Empathy. Empathy, as most of you know, is built on experience and bolstered by wisdom. So empathy has heart in it, not just sympathy, because you've never necessarily experienced that yourself. Empathy carries with it a sense of experience in the situation, let's say, even, and therefore wisdom. And to be empathetic means to be like Christ, who humbled himself and, as we know, was tempted in every way, yet without sin. He was the one who said this. Go to Mark 10.45. Mark 10.45. He was the one who said this. So an empathetic leader behaves a certain way, responds to situations a certain way. We have Christ to thank for his example of perfection, of perfect leadership. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Hmm. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So our greatest example of leadership is Christ Jesus. And from this week's blog titled, The Empathetic Leader, quote, Great leaders are servants first. A servant's first order of business is to tend to others. 
They are thrilled when others succeed and pained by their failures, a la Romans 12, 15. We call this empathy. We call this empathy. They are thrilled when others succeed and pained by their failures. Might we say that Jesus embodied these attributes? Yeah. How about love? Was Jesus the embodiment of love, I ask? Another excerpt from this week's blog titled The Empathetic Leader. True empathy implies sacrificial love. Great leaders put the welfare of others over their own. Personal advancement is not their objective. Love doesn't motivate that way. Just read 1 Corinthians 13. I think we read that last week together. True empathy implies sacrificial love. And great leaders put the welfare of others over their own. Personal advancement is not their objective. Love doesn't motivate that way. Selfless not selfishness or self-absorption. Selflessness. True godly Christ-like love cannot help but express itself. It's always looking for an opportunity to increase the welfare of others, to lean in, to help out, that's what true love looks like. That's why your love can be pretty vapid if you just gum flap it. Now, it's difficult when we put Christ in front of us <laughs> and then the Spirit asks us to stand there and go, okay, I'm going to self-evaluate against Him. He's perfect. So if you're saying, oh boy, I am so far from this, if you're honest, and you're saying, I am so far from this. I'm a pretty self-absorbed individual. Don't be discouraged. Learn. Be honest. Homo legato. Confess who you are. Be honest, but don't be discouraged. There's always today. One more excerpt from the blog. Contrary to popular belief, great leaders aren't born. They're not born that way. They are followers first. The way I've always described leadership um, is in order to be even a good leader, you have to be first a great follower. Contrary to popular belief, great leaders aren't born, they are followers first. As Christians, we must go to the Word of God in humility for guidance. Since we are all leaders in some aspect of our lives, our aspirations must be excellence. Excellence. That's a word that the Spirit has been bringing up from behind this pulpit for months now. The concept of excellence. And that is not just you being excellent on a Sunday morning. I think it's excellent that you're here. That's awesome. But excellence, we are supposed to be witnesses. We're, our lives are supposed to be testimonies. But that one that we believe in, the most excellent one of all, and so that excellence must be a way of life. You have to carry into every aspect of your living. Like, I, like you know, I was in Orlando on Thursday, Miami on Friday, a hellish flight on the way back, got home on early Saturday, whatever. I'm not complaining. I'm just sharing so I get a good laugh and maybe you empathize, maybe. Um, when I'm surrounded by people that I'm 
in many ways, you know, pretty convinced that uh, could care less about Christ. I bow my head and I pray in those moments, especially before I go up and have to present for an hour in front of 60 people or something. And I say, whatever comes out of my mouth, Lord, let it be edifying to you, to your name. Whatever I say in this moment, may you be glorified. That's what it means to be excellent. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. I'm just saying it's a good example. In the moment, in every moment of your life, don't just play church. We are supposed to be the church, capital C. The organism Christ referred to as his bride. We're supposed to be that. And that doesn't exist inside these four walls only. <clears throat> That's who we are. Excellence. We all lead in some area. Great leaders aren't born, they are followers first. As Christians, we must go to the Word of God in humility for guidance, since we are all leaders in some aspect of our lives. Our aspirations must be excellence as a privilege, or it's a privilege and honor to lead others. I think the Spirit's had a lot to say about self-examination lately. And for that to be of any help at all, you must have one thing, always. If you're going to self-examine, if you're going to stand up to the truth that is the Word, if you're going to honestly look in the mirror, you have to have one thing. It starts with an H. Humility. Arrogance is unteachable. Arrogance embodies something quite different than the character of Christ. Arrogance embodies Jesus' words, how great is your darkness when you think you're in the light. Arrogance will insist it is right when it isn't. Why? Pride. Pride. This was the topic the Spirit dealt with in last week's blog, which was titled, How I Missed My Mark Marksmanship Ribbon in Boot Camp. <laughs> Quote, If we take our best shot with a crooked aiming system, we'll never hit our intended target. No matter how focused or intentional we may be when we pull the trigger. Let me say it again. If we take our best shot with a crooked aiming system, we'll never hit our intended target, no matter how focused or intentional we may be when we pull the trigger. Are arrogant people intentional in their behavior? Absolutely. Absolutely. They are often, as I've seen it, as the Bible describes it, overly dogmatic even about their convictions because they don't believe they could possibly be wrong about them. And that points right back to unteachable arrogance. Now, to be fair, can an otherwise well-intentioned Christian even be this brand of arrogance? What do you think? Hint. Look in the mirror. Raise your hand if you're not arrogant. Anybody? Exactly. So arrogant people can be very intentional in their behavior. Next quote from How I Missed My Marksmanship Ribbon. 
This reminds me of a well-intentioned Christian whose guidance system is still polluted by worldly thinking, a.k.a. sin. There are lots of Christians who truly mean well, but aren't aware of how misguided their thoughts and actions are. Why? Because they are deceived by sin itself. It's one of sin's favorite tricks is to get you to think it doesn't exist in your life. To get you to think that how you think and how you behave even is justifiable. In other words, it doesn't want to be identified. It likes when you ignore it. Support it even. Coddle it. I did you a solid in that blog last week by linking to part one of the series, The Deceitfulness of Sin, which I would encourage. Maybe that's what you do instead of turning on the reruns of, I don't know, what's happening. Did I date myself? Anybody remember that? Remember that? Was that the one with rerun? (laughs) That was the rerun one, right? No? Or was that JJ? Which one was JJ? Which one? That was it? Yeah. Dynamite. Instead of looking at that stuff, why not start listening to reruns of messages? Like part one of this deceitfulness of sin. I'm just throwing it out there. One last excerpt. Sin is extremely difficult to overcome because it not only perverts your line of sight, but it also convinces you that you've been hitting the center of the bullseye. In fact, you are so convinced of your righteousness that you begin to treasure the very fruit of your sin. That's why it's so difficult It's extremely difficult to overcome because it not only perverts your line of sight, but it convinces you that you've been hitting the center of the bullseye. In fact, you are so convinced of your righteousness that you begin to treasure the very fruit of your sin. Again, the point the Spirit's making is very simple. Not new to most of you. Um, Arrogance is unteachable. What is the root system for arrogance? The sin nature, of course. The flesh. So again, the Spirit's had an awful lot to say about self-examination lately. And that's not something I can do for you. Seems like every time I help somebody out with that problem, they go away. So the Spirit's had an awful lot to say about self-examination. My prayer is that you listen to what He's saying to you, to this congregation. What He's saying is, look in the mirror. What He's saying is, stop lying to yourself. Stop living in sin. Stop being a hustler. You're not hustling anybody. You're not fooling anyone. You're only hurting yourself and others. You're not beating the system. You're not one up in God. You're not pulling the sheet over anyone's eyes. That's what he's been saying. All right, let's go back to our primary course of study where we pick up where we left off last time. And now remember the context before you go there. The context is that the writer had given the stark warning of apostasy. That was uh, verses 4 through 6 in chapter 6 of Hebrews. Then some encouragement based on godly fruit that was apparent in his audience. He said, but for you, we have a greater hope. 
But then before departing even from that topic, he gave one last insight that the spirits had us focusing on, namely persistence. In other words, I'm not making this judgment. My hope is not convinced, just like I could say the same thing right now. Just because you're sitting in this seat this morning does not mean that this vessel is convinced on that fact alone that you're a persistent saint in the faith. It's not just this sort of, well, I'm here today, and then everyone's hope should be up to the nines because you made it to church, let's say. It's not like that. This is an issue of persistence. This writer was writing from a situation, from a vantage point that said, I've seen your fruit. God has seen your fruit. Over a span of time, you have persisted this way. Therefore, we have hope in your salvation. Hmm. Throughout the Bible, we know that this doctrine of the persistent saint exists. And just, just in case you've forgotten or you've never heard this in your life before, Every believer is a saint, by definition, according to Holy Scripture. Unlike the Roman Catholic definition of saints, that's a false doctrine. According to Holy Scripture, every believer is a saint. So on this topic of sainthood, go to 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Hang out. We're just going to do a little, just a little sidebar on the topic of sainthood and the simple fact, because I want you to be convinced. I don't want you to be tricked into thinking, oh, well, that guy over there, or that lady, they're, they're a saint. You ever heard somebody say that? Oh, they're a saint. They're really good. They go to church, and they look good when they go to church, and they get down on their knees, and they pray, and they do this, and oh my, they're like a saint. No wonder why the church is named after them. That's all garbage doctrine. That's not truth. Every believer, 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, every believer in Christ is a saint by definition, according to Holy Scripture. And that's what counts. Not some religion or some church. Little c. 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth to those sanctified in Christ Jesus that's a refer reference to positional sanctification or in other words those that are saved to those sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be what? saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Ephesians 4.11. Go forward. Ephesians 4.11. I'm just rooting out false doctrine if it's still there. You know, you probably shouldn't even use that language. I know that people still use it. Oh, they were such a saint. People that know better, right? because it has a certain resonance, especially in this area, don't use that language because you're actually teaching a false doctrine. You're abiding in something that's false. You're encouraging something that's not true. Ephesians 4.11, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip who? The saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. That's my job. If you're a believer and I'm a pastor, my job is to equip you. And you, if you're a believer, are a saint. Look at Ephesians 5.1. Just forward a little bit. Ephesians 5.1. Therefore, be imitators of God 
as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among who? Saints. In other words, you are the body of Christ. Act like it. Again, every believer is a saint. Do not be deceived by the Roman Catholic definition of so-called saints. All right, back to our passage where the writer is referring to the doctrine of the persistent saint. Hebrews 6.11. Go to Hebrews 6.11. <clears throat> Hebrews 6.11 And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So you see this sort of play here in verse 11 where it ends in until the end, in other words, there's some kind of a persistence to the end. And then in verse 12, what happens if you persist to the end? You inherit the promises. Our principle from last time was persistence in the faith is evidence of salvation. Conversely, a person who abandons the faith and lacks persistence shows evidence of an unregenerate heart. That's not me talking, that's Holy Scripture. It makes total sense. We noted last time the words of Jesus' brother James to help us along here. Let's grab the highlight reel. Go to James 2.14. James 2.14. I think I would have liked James, personally. Because he was just a realist, right? He wrote factually, matter-of-factly, if you would. James 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that type of faith save him? Can that faith right there, that kind of faith, save him? Look at verse 20. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Do I need to show you this? Is this rocket science, he's saying? And then verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is what? Dead. So two things to note here that relate back to how the Spirit opened up this morning even. Number one, there is such a thing as faith that doesn't sanctify, certainly not save. In other words, there's a type of faith that isn't godly. Number two, arrogance will cling to said faith dogmatically. There's such a thing as errant faith, and arrogance will cling to it dogmatically. And that's what he was highlighting this morning at the start. Back to our primary passage. Look at uh, Hebrews 6.11. Hebrews 6, verse 11. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. In other words, persistence in your repentance and faith. In other words, that you show your salvation by your works, a la James 2, that we just saw. Verse 12, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And that's where we ended last time. 
We also read the remainder of chapter 6 to get a teaser trailer of what's to come in our studies. And I mentioned this last time where the writer employs the expository style. So he brings back in data from trustworthy context. In other words, he introduces some more Old Testament scripture as the foundation for a, an upcoming conclusion. He's, he does this, you know this, when we study the context of this book. He does this over and over again. Say, you remember Abraham? Remember him? Think of it this way, and then take that same principle and apply it to your life, your experience as a believer. Because he was one too. So he gets a little ex expository in his style. And the point he makes is regarding the integrity of God. Specifically when he makes an oath with us. So he takes the, all of us at this point as readers. He took his audience back. He takes us all back to Old Testament scripture. So that we can discover for ourselves through said scripture what the integrity of God looks like, especially when he makes an oath. We know from Holy Scripture that God cannot lie. It's against his very nature. Go to Numbers 23, 19. Hold your thumb there. Hopefully you have a bookmark or something at this point. Numbers 23, 19. God cannot lie. I find that very encouraging because none of us can make that claim. But he can. Numbers 23, 19. God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? In other words, may it never be. Those are rhetorical questions. Go to Titus 1-2. All the way towards the end of your Bible. Titus Titus 1, 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. God, who never lies. It's against his nature. And then contrarily, we have Satan who is called the father of lies. That's all he knows how to do. Go to John 8.44. John 8.44. So we have God, who cannot lie, and then we have Satan, who that's all he can do, because that's his nature. John 8.44 you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So you have God on one hand, who can't lie by his very nature. And then you have Satan on the other hand, who can only tell lies because of his nature. All right. Let's go back to where we have uh, this audience in the book of Hebrews. And let's see what the writer has to say about God's integrity. 
Go back to Hebrews 6.13. Okay? Now just remember that God cannot lie, and that matters here. Because I think we even forget it. We say to ourselves academically, is that fair? I know, God can never lie, but then, then why don't you believe all his promises then? I guess you don't really believe it then, do you? God says he's going to do something. You know what Holy Scripture says? I cannot lie. When my word goes out, it never comes back empty-handed. It always accomplishes my will. Right? Then why don't you believe him? It's a good question. Because the truth is, you don't believe him. That's the whole point. Because we don't have perfect faith. Faith is trust. Faith is believing. If we had perfect faith, we would believe everything he said, and life would be grand. Hebrews 6.13. So he uses the fact that God never lies. For when God made a promise to Abraham, again, getting expository, looking back to Old Testament truth, when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. That's two-thirds, if you want to get technical in some ways. Two-thirds of the Abrahamic covenant mentioned here. The missing is land, but maybe you could roll that under blessing. Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited evidence of persistent faith obtained the promise. Verse 16, For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. Did he have to do that for his own purposes? No, because he doesn't lie. But he sort of did a, he did him a solid. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to make a, an oath here. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. I mean, let's think about it. If you... Why do, why do even human beings make an oath? I mean, why can't we just say, hey, will you do this for me? I'll do it for you. And it should be it, right? Wouldn't that be grand? Wouldn't that be awesome if you could actually believe people at the... No, 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 no. You make an oath. Why? To show. To take it that one step further. You get the point? So God didn't do this because he needed the oath that he needed to be somehow held or else he was going to break the oath. He did it for the people. He does it for us. So he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, and that's a reference to the promise and the oath that guaranteed it, in which it is impossible for God to lie, there we go again, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, this passage can be split into two parts, at least for our purposes today. One is the expository aspect where the writer reminds this congregation of God's promise to Abraham. Again, look at verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. What is the, this promise the writer wrote about? Remember, this is an, presumably an educated, small, local church assembly, house church, which is how they did it back then. 
They would have been educated on Old Testament Scripture, but maybe you're not. So let's go to, hold your thumb, go to Genesis 15.1. What was he referring back to? So we find it here. So I always tell somebody who's just starting out, I tell them, hey, look. They say, well, what book should I read first? I usually send them to John. And then possibly Acts. I think about who I'm talking to. Possibly Acts. And then right back to Genesis. Sometimes John right to Genesis. Genesis is, kicks it all off, you see. You can't fully understand the New Testament until you have read Genesis and understand it, at least to some degree. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord. And he counted it to him as righteousness. And that's referenced in Romans 4, 3, Galatians 3, 6, James 2, 23. He believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, <clears throat> Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Verse 10. And he brought him, brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. FYI, a sign of ancient covenants was to cut an animal in half and then the pledging parties would walk through the middle of it, accepting the same fate as the animals should they breach the covenant. That's how they did it back then. That's how a covenant was made. Verse 11, And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, Dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great liver, river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. A lot of land promised. We call this the Abrahamic Covenant, of course, which includes three key elements, land, progeny, and blessings. We also call this, now listen, we also call this an unconditional covenant, and this matters, an unconditional covenant, because it's unilaterally upheld by only one of the two parties involved. 
versus a bilateral covenant or a conditional covenant. Okay? The Abrahamic covenant was a covenant that God made with Abram. And he was the one to uphold it, no matter what. In the case of the Abrahamic covenant, God is the promise giver, so the keeping of the, keeping of the covenant depends wholly on God's integrity to his own word. And as we noted earlier, guess what? God cannot lie, nor does he ever break a promise. So logically speaking, if you just put those two facts together, logically speaking, an unconditional covenant given by God is the best covenant anyone could ever hope for. Because God forbid it depends on you. Because you're going to break it. Raise your hand if you've ever been 100% faithful to God. <laughs> but yet he's made promises to you as his children, right? Do you imagine if it was only based on us, if it was a bilateral? We'd be in trouble. So logically speaking, this is the best kind of covenant a person could ever hope for. He says, here's my oath to you. I will do this, I promise, based on myself. And I'm perfect, and I never lie. Best covenant anyone could ever hope for. Why? Because once it's made, even God himself, if he had some weird out-of-body experience, which he would never, couldn't break it. If he did, he'd ruin his own perfection, and therefore we'd be worshiping a flawed God, which means, of course, that he would no longer be holy, and everything about him unravels, which would further imply that our faith is in vain. But the good news is that God is perfect, as is his integrity, which means that when he makes an unconditional promise or covenant with someone, like Abram, it is 100% rock solid and 100% guaranteed to be upheld. Now, just for the sake of clarity, can the establishment, and I'm teaching you about the fundamentals of covenants, can the establishment of the original covenant be conditioned on something else? Not the keeping, the establishment of it. Yes, but that's a different aspect to think about. There's a difference between making a covenant with another party based on conditions being met and keeping a covenant based on certain conditions being met afterwards. For example, I wouldn't do this because I, I like my Burt's Bees too much. But if I said to you right now, the first person to come up here and grab this thing, you can have it. And if Joey's like, I'm in. He becomes like a cheetah and pounces on it and grabs it. And right before he grabs it, I go, ah, I was just kidding. Or after he grabs it, I go up to him and I say, give me that back. I need it. I changed my mind. What's the first condition? Whoever gets there first. If you get there first, I'm giving it to you. But there's a condition, which means whoever's here first. But once you have it, it's yours to keep. I'm never going to ask for it back. You see the difference? There can be conditions in making a covenant which are different than keeping a covenant. Is that fair? Okay. So there's a difference between making a covenant with another party based on conditions being met and keeping a covenant based on certain conditions being met afterwards. So don't get the two confused. This will help. Go to Genesis 22:17. Genesis 22:17. Now the God who cannot lie said this in verse 17. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven 
and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So I just want to be clear here. In Abraham's case, the one the writer of Hebrews used for illustration, God chose to make a covenant with Abraham based on the condition of his obedience. He said, because, he said, I'll do all this because you obeyed, because you believed. You were able to enter into this based on something, but once you're in it, that's it. The presses will never stop, I promise, personally. This should start, some, some of you probably are like, hey, that sounds an awful lot like something else. There's a condition to get into the promise, but once you're in the promise, lights out, you're in. There's no turning back. But there are conditions to get into the promise. So I just wanted to be clear, because that's in play here in the book of Hebrews. And the, the uh, audience would have understood it. So in Abraham's case, again, the one that the writer of Hebrews used for illustration, God chose to make a covenant with Abraham based on the condition of his obedience. However, once God made the covenant, since it was unconditional and unilateral, the keeping of it depended wholly on himself. In other words, his own integrity towards his promises. This is the absolute best type of covenant because it will never be broken, unlike covenants or oaths that people make. Raise your hand if you've ever had somebody not break an oath to you. No one ever in your whole life has broken an oath to you. It's unheard of. I don't, I've never met anybody I mean, you could just look in the mirror and go, that person. <laughs> I promised myself I was going to... I said it. It was New Year's Eve. Okay, okay, maybe I had a couple of champagnes or whatever. But I promised myself that I was going to do this thing. And it lasted about a week. What happened? What happened to your promise? The perfect example, now hopefully you laugh with me in this, my old... Uh, an old friend of mine used to own a gym. He says, I love New Year's. Want to know why? Because everybody makes, I'm going to the gym. I'm going to get fit. I'm signing up. And they all, they used to throw the initiation fee, whatever it was, at my friend. He'd be like, woo, this is like making money. And then two weeks later, all those people, like 90% of them were gone. So he kind of liked New Year's Eve because all those like, oh, I'm totally doing this. You can't even keep an oath with yourself. You can't even keep a promise to yourself. Think about that. How amazing is it that we have a perfect God that can't do anything but just the opposite? Can't do anything but keep his promises. But yet, again, we don't believe him. All right, let's take this back to our primary passage now. Go to Hebrews 6.13. Hebrews 6.13. And so this pastor is doing what I often try to do, which is send encouragement your way based on the promises of God, especially if you're a child of God. Hebrews 6.13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise, for people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. And this is the point where we take the gravity of what we just noted regarding an oath made by God. Take everything we, the Spirit just pointed out this morning about God cannot lie and when he makes an oath, it's for us to see and depend on. And we take all of that, the full weight of it, and we put it on this passage. And then we observe how the writer makes his conclusion. So that was the expository, and then we get to the conclusion, right? 
verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things, again, a reference to the promise and the oath that guaranteed it, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We didn't necessarily have Abraham's hope, We have a certain hope in our own way as children of God. But you see how the, the illustration with Abraham plays. It's the same God. In other words, if God makes a promise to those of us who have placed our faith and trust in him for salvation, then we ought to cling to it. So regarding our salvation, we must go back to the distinction I mentioned also earlier regarding the making and the keeping of a promise. So you're going to hold your thumb again. We're going to note Jesus' words regarding God's promise of salvation. And while we do, keep an eye on the prerequisite condition and the subsequent keeping of the promise. Okay? Go to John 3.16. John 3.16. Keep your eye on the prerequisite condition and then the subsequent keeping of the promise. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, there's your prerequisite condition, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And that hearkens to the promise kept by God's integrity. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In other words, based on the precondition of belief. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. A.K.A. Not everyone meets the prerequisite condition of obtaining the promise. And the example on the table for us, the Old Testament example, was Abraham. Because you obeyed, because you believed, then I'm going to seal this promise of land, progeny, blessing with a covenant, with an oath. Same thing with salvation. But not everyone meets the bar. Not everybody meets the prerequisite to enter the promise. Verse 20, For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So this is the promise that the, write, the writer of Hebrews was referring to. God's promise to save and keep those who believe in him. He's saying that the same God who made the Abrahamic covenant regarding the land, the progeny, the promises, is the same God the same God who has made his promises to his children. All right, go back to Hebrews 6.17. I'll close. Hebrews 6.17. So, when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Everything that we are as a child of God depends on his integrity. If he says we're saved because we believe, then guess what? We're His. There's no going back. There's a whole doctrine called eternal security, most of you know. Once saved, always saved. Right? 
just make sure you're saved. A lot of people say a little prayer when they're 10 years old. They're like, I'm good. I was saved when I was 10, you know? But there's been no persistence whatsoever in their life. So just make sure that you're saved. But if you truly are saved, then you're saved forever. And you should cling to God's integrity on the topic. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Are you hopeful? No? Yeah? But you see, why aren't we like lifting the roof off this place? It's the greatest news you could ever know. That God has saved you. And no one can take you out of his hand. No one. Because it's based on his integrity. You will never be lost. I wonder how much we trust him. I wonder. I mean, if our actions speak louder than our words. Do we fully, can we look in the mirror and say, Lord, I, I trust you. Can we say that? That's between you and the Lord. So I hope you're hopeful. I mean, you should be. That's the point. So please be encouraged. Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning, for truth that sets us free. Thank you for giving us a hope that is an anchor to our souls even. Thank you for allowing us to learn the truth, to be enlightened once again, that you are not a God that lies. You cannot lie. That we ought to rest assured in all of your promises. So we just... Thank you for your patience and your mercy and your love in our lives as we are sanctified and as we figure these things out over time. We just ask for your blessings as we take all this truth back to the privacy of our own souls, to our families even, and then to a world that needs the truth so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.